Yes, I would like to begin by introducing to you our speaker, well known to most of us here at the hospital. He was requested by the Cleveland Clinic Department of Neurosurgery to give a very prestigious lecture to the graduating class. It's called the Gardner Lecture. Um, he was asked by Dr. Edward Benzel, Chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Cleveland Clinic. The Gardner Lecture is named for the second chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Cleveland Clinic, James Gardner, MD, who was in that position for 35 years and responsible for m many of the modern advances in neurosurgery that we enjoy today. Originally, prominent chairmen from neurosurgery programs all over the country were invited each year to speak to these graduating residents. And starting about 10 years ago, distinguished alumni of their neurosurgery training program at Cleveland Clinic began to be invited to give this annual lecture. This year, the Gardner Lecture was given by our very own Moses Tagioff. He's been a member of our medical staff since July of 1973. His specialty, as you might imagine, is neurosurgery. He's currently the medical director of perioperative and strategic surgical services at Washington Hospital. He has also been our chief of staff at Washington Hospital, and he received his medical degree from the University of Bombay in 1966, completed his surgery residence at Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and his neurosurgery residency at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Dr. Tagioff lives in Pleasanton with his wife, Nafisa. He has two adult children and is the proud grandfather of three. With that, I'd like Moses to come forward. He is going to be giving to us the same speech he gave at the Cleveland Clinic. Thank you very much, Nancy, members of the board, fellow physicians and friends. When I was in practice, one of my patients asked a nurse on 6 West, how long has he been a neurosurgeon? And she said, what do you mean how long? He was born a neurosurgeon. <laughs> Having said that, I didn't say this at the clinic, but today is exactly 43 years it was Friday the 13th of July, 1973, that I did my first surgery. And all my life, I've been here at Washington Hospital, and I've been, I'm very proud to say that. My talk is about footprints, and I address the graduating class at the Cleveland Clinic. Basically, I've broken my talk into three parts. I wanted the residents there to know who Gardner was. So we're gonna talk a little bit about Gardner. I might bore some of you, but Gardner was an absolutely amazing man, and you guys have to hear a little bit about him. I also am going to talk a little bit about myself as to why I was there in their presence. And finally, I'm going to talk about them, the graduating class, and the do's and don'ts of going into the world. I called my talk Footprints because I wanted to tell them about their footprints. This is what they gave me as I left. It's a glass award and uh, the, the globe on top revolves. And I agree with everything they say on it except the last line. Having said that, I wanted to let you all know that three of the neurosurgeons, <laughs> three of the neurosurgeons at Washington Hospital came from the Cleveland Clinic. The first neurosurgeon was Dr. Stanton Schiffer who was my chief resident. The second was me. And the third neurosurgeon is still with us today, Dr. Desmond Erasmus. Because this lecture is designated the Gardner Lecture, I thought it'd be appropriate to tell you a few words about this amazing man. Contrary to many assumptions, Gardner was not the first neurosurgeon at the Cleveland Clinic. The first neurosurgeon there was Dr. Charles Locke. And it's very interesting to learn how Gardner came to be at the Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Charles Locke was born, I'm not sure, but I think he was born in San Francisco. He was recruited to the Cleveland Clinic as the first neurosurgeon 
by a man called Howard Mafsiger. Of all places, that's the man who circled. Howard Mafsiger was a professor of neurosurgery right here in San Francisco at UCSF. In 1929, a devastating fire erupted at the Cleveland Clinic, and it was in the x-ray department. There were thousands of nitrocellulose x-ray films that burst into flames. He was on duty, that's Dr. Charles Locke. He managed to escape. He actually did not get burnt at the fire. He climbed up, and there was a skylight, he got out of it. But he had inhaled so much of the fumes that four hours later he became cyanotic, could not breathe, and he died of pulmonary edema. When Dr. Nafziger heard about this, he decided he must send another replacement. So this is where Dr. Gardner steps in. Gardner replaced the existing chief of neurosurgery, Dr. Charles Locke. Now, Gardner was born in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. That's your town. And he obtained his medical degree in 1924. He went to the University of Pennsylvania. He spent some time with Dr. Charles Frazier, who is a very, very well-known neurologist from the East Coast. Dr. Frazier was not a neurosurgeon, but he did some dabble in some neurosurgery. And then he worked with Dr. Spiller, another neurologist, and when they heard about the tragic news of the death of Dr. Locke, they told Gardner, go to the Cleveland Clinic. When Gardner came to the Cleveland Clinic, he didn't realize he was going to be there for 25 years. That's Gardner, by the way, as a young man. During his 25-year career, he invented many, 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 many things. He had 200 scientific papers. He described for the first time the sitting position in neurosurgery. Nobody had ever done that before. He invented what is called the G-suit. You can see him putting on the G-suit. G is for Gardner. Uh, this is what keeps the blood in the head when you sit a patient up and does not allow you to suck in air from the brain and create what is called an air embolus. Many deaths occurred that way before the G-suit was invented. In order to sit up in a sitting position, he had to create a chair. This is called the Gardner chair. You see the head points that hold the patient's head. That's his invention. He described tantalum cranioplasties while he was in the Navy. Tantalum is a metal, and he repaired all the skull defects with metal. His career spanned over 35 years. He trained a total of 28 residents and partially trained 14. Besides his active career as a neurosurgeon, he also had a great personal life. He was the father of three children. He served as a private in the U.S. Army, and then in World War II, he became a lieutenant commander in the U.S. Navy. He found enough time to enjoy hunting, fishing, ice skating, tennis, and participated incessantly in barber shop quartets. We were suffering when he sang, but we had to listen to him because he was the boss. He retired at the age of 64 into private practice in Cleveland, Ohio, and he was there till 1987 when he passed away. By the way, if you haven't noticed it, that's Dr. Donald Doan, the chair of neurosurgery, awarding Dr. Gardner the Congress of Neurological Surgery Award. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about how to live your life, because I believe in change. Be the change you want to see in the world. That was Mohandas Karamchand's, Gandhi's most famous saying. And there he is, Dr. Doan. This was when he came here to Washington Hospital to talk to us about mentoring. And at the time that he spoke, People at the Cleveland Clinic liked what he said, so they plagiarized his entire speech, many of them, and they kept giving it, pretending to be their talk. Here's Albert Einstein, who also talks about change, be the one who can change what is possible. So let me tell you why I'm here today for you. I want to talk to you about your life moving forward. Think about these words for a moment be the change who can change what is possible. I always wanted to become a heart surgeon. I wanted to do the FRCS diploma, as 
Dr. Achanta, you know that every young man, at least during my day, wanted to become an FRCS. The Mecca was always England. So I went to the British Embassy when I just finished my training and I was entering my internship and I told them I wanted to go and become a heart surgeon in England and get an FRCS degree. They told me I couldn't do it for three more years. And I was broke, I had no money, I was married. My wife was just about to deliver our first child, Michelle. So I told the people at the British Embassy that it's gonna be their loss. If they don't give me a visa now, I'm going and I'm never coming back here. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I said that and I walked out. That very night, I went to a party and G.K. Chesterton once said, the amazing thing about miracles is that they do happen. I went to this party, it was in Malabar Hill as it's called, and I sat in the corner, my wife was with me by my side, I was upset, severely disappointed, angry, and a total stranger whom I'd never met before came and sat by my side. His name, Noel Gioze. I remember it like it was yesterday. I hear you're a doctor, he told me. I said, yes. I'm a doctor too. I said, yes. I didn't want to talk to him. And he said, I'm a pediatrician. I've come here to inoculate the children of India. So I said, okay. And then he said, I'm with the Peace Corps. I've come here from the Cleveland Clinic. So then I told him my sad story that the UK embassy had told me, no, go wait three more years. He burst out laughing. He said, why are you going to England? That's passe. Nobody goes to England anymore. Go to America. Heart surgery? Cleveland Clinic? So I said, where's the Cleveland Clinic? He said, in Cleveland. <laughs> the, where's Cleveland? I said, and he said, that's New York. This is literally the way he said it. That's Los Angeles, and that's Cleveland. Okay, somewhere between New York and Los Angeles. Write this down. Pierce H. Mullally, Director of Medical Education, St. Vincent Charity Hospital. That's the back door to the Cleveland Clinic. I said, but if I apply to the Cleveland Clinic, they'll think I'm charming snakes and riding the backs of tigers. He said, no, 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 no. Write to Pierce Malali. He's the director of education at St. Vincent Charity Hospital. As Ed will tell you, it's downtown in Cleveland and all the residents from St. Vincent Charity, from the Cleveland Clinic, go to St. Vincent Charity Hospital to do their surgery on uh, indigent patients. So I said, okay. He says, that's the back door. They'll see how well you work and you'll get into the clinic. Okay. So I wrote down his name and address. And then I said, what do they pay interns? He said, $300 a month. My wife was sitting next to me. Big smile broke out on her face. $300 a month was an enormous sum. I was working in a hospital as an admitting clerk for 40 rupees a month, which is a little over half a dollar. So I wrote to Pierce Malali, and he sent me a DSP-66 form, which is a visa, in exactly three weeks, almost exactly to the day. So we went to Cleveland. I had $8 in my pocket. My wife was with me. My newborn daughter was two and a half, three months old. And we arrive at St. Vincent Charity Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio. Now, the man that circled there was a very, very prominent neurosurgeon in private practice in Cleveland, Ohio. His name was Ed Bishop. So the first night that we had all gathered at St. Vincent Charity Hospital, Dr. Malali made 28 residents sit all around in a room. And all he did was, I want each of you to say one sentence in English. Not a single intern could speak in English. The gist of the conversation was, hello, how are you? Uh, 
uh, thank you, goodbye. When it came to my turn, I told him my name, my age, and why I was there. He said, good. Tomorrow you're going to help Ed Bishop remove a brain tumor. I was absolutely mortified. The resident from the Cleveland Clinic did not want to come to St. Vincent Charity Hospital. That was a miracle. So they put me there instead. But I cannot go to the OR. I've never seen a brain tumor and I've never done brain surgery in my life. He says, no worry, you go. You owe me, remember? You wrote to me three months ago. Now you owe me. All right. I was awake all night. My wife by my side, I was trembling. Got up like at 4.30 that morning and we went to St. Vincent Charity Hospital to remove a brain tumor. Bishop walks into the operating room. It was at seven in the morning. I looked at him, he was tall, well-dressed, and I don't know if you can see it, he had a butch haircut, very much not in style at the time. He had come from the Korean War. And I addressed him, I said, Your Honor. He said, don't call me Your Honor, I'm Dr. Bishop. We're gonna take out a brain tumor. So what are you going to do with your life? I said, I wanna become a heart surgeon. He says, what? Any old, are there any cardiac surgeons here? <laughs> Any old fool can do heart surgery. You gotta do brain surgery. So I said, well, let's see. So we went in and we did the craniotomy. It was a very malignant brain cancer. The same thing that our dear Taylor McAdam Bell had. While we were in the operating room, he told me that the brain was the most beautiful organ you can ever lay your eyes on. And if you look carefully, you'll see it pulsating. He was very dramatic. He said, look, lad, look. Anyway, I stood, I looked, and then I said, well, maybe I'll consider being a brain surgeon. Surgery went well. I asked him, how do I become a brain surgeon? He says, why, there's no other place but the Cleveland Clinic. His name is Dr. Donald Doan. He's my very dear friend, Colin. Tell him I sent you. Okay, that night I went home and I did one of my first of many guess what's. I told my wife Nafisa, guess what? I'm gonna become a brain surgeon. So that's what made me do that. Now, I called Dr. Doan's office while I was an intern and I called him again and again and again and again, almost three months. At the time, they never had assistants, they had secretaries. And his secretary's name was Mary Axe. We were on a first name basis. Mary Axe, I want to speak to Don Doan. No, you can't, he's busy. You can't. No, you can't. And then, when we got on first name basis, and I started calling her Mary, and she started calling me Moses, finally she said, okay, I'll give you one minute. I don't care whether you're talking or he's talking, in one minute, 60 seconds, we're gonna hang up. Okay, thank you, Mary. So he comes on the phone and he says, who are you? Are you a patient? I said, no, no, no. I'm a doctor. I'm at St. Vincent Charity Hospital down the road. And I want to come and study neurosurgery. Your friend, Dr. Bishop, told me to call you. Okay. He says, have you applied? I said, no. Why have you not applied? Because I don't want you to refuse me before you see me. He liked that. Okay, he said, tomorrow, come at five to the doctor's changing room in the locker room. I said, all right, I'll be there at five in the evening. No, 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 5 a.m. Okay, and don't be late. That's Dr. Doan, by the way, in the same photograph. And we'll get back to this photograph later. That's me. That's Dr. Gardner. And if you look carefully, I don't have a circle, but two physicians to my left is a very familiar face. Desmond Erasmus. I managed to get him here too, by the way. That brings me to my stint. Now I'm at Washington Hospital in Fremont, California. How did I get to Washington Hospital? In my third year of training, Dr. Doan said, go anywhere in the world you want to go. So I decided to go to London, England and show them how good I had become. So I went to the mecca of neurosurgery in London. It's called Queen Square. And I worked with 
Professor Valentine Loeb, the biggest name ever outside America. Valentine Loeb was an Australian knighted by the Queen. And his father, if you, any of you saw the movie The Queen's Speech, his father taught King George VI how to stop stammering. Anyway, while I was working at Queen Square for about three or four weeks, I got this page overhead. Dr. Tagioff, please pick up your page. And there was Dr. Stanton Schiffer on the, on the page. By the way, that made me famous over there because here's a resident from America who's getting calls from America. Hi, Stan, what are you doing in London? He said, I'm not in London, I'm in Fremont, California. I said, where's Fremont? We went through the same dialogue. And he told me, you know, the BART train, it occasionally stops there. That year, the BART line had come to Fremont and never stopped. It kept going. So I said, so what do you want? He says, I want to come to London and see you and ask you to join me in private practice. Okay. He says, you know the Churchill Hotel? I'll be in the lobby next Monday. I'm going to bring Joan, and we're going to talk about you coming to Washington Hospital in Fremont, California. He came with his wife, Joan, and at those days, we never had smartphones. We had Viewmaster. He brought pictures of Washington Hospital, the Bay Bridge, the BART train, the gladiolus in the back of the hospital growing. And none of that really excited me until he put up this picture. A huge lemon tree. Uh, this is not his lemon tree, but it was exactly like this. And sitting right in that lemon tree was his son, Eric, whom I knew. And Eric's face was as big as the lemons. And I said, what's that? He said, that's my lemon tree. Where is that? In my backyard. I said, if I come to Fremont, can I have a lemon tree like that? He said, sure. He said, the weather and the soil is so good, you put a seed and jump out of the way. Those were his words. Because it grows so fast. I'll pay you lots of money, and next year you'll become a full partner. Thank you. He smiled. I put out my hand. I told him, go back. Get your attorneys to draw up a contract. So that's how I wound up in Fremont, the famous lemon tree. Now, let's talk about you as residents. We've got to talk a bit about life balance. Work hard. Do not neglect your family at all cost. You need to establish life balance in order to be successful in what you do. Your family will be your foremost contributor to what you do and to your success in life. As a neurosurgeon, there will be constant pressures from you, not only from your patients, but very, as your peers as well. Do not neglect your family in spite of all these pressures. It will not occur automatically. You have to make time for it. And learn to love what you do. Then I told them that Confucius once stated, choose a job you love and you'll never have to work a day in your life. I believe that axiom is very, very true. Now I want to talk to you about the truth. As I started preparing this lecture, I got to talking with one of my colleagues right here and asked him if they were very, very, very sick, what would they expect from their physician? And his answer, he said, was, I'd expect the truth. His wife was very, very sick, and the internist who was treating his wife did not divulge the real truth to him. That broke his heart. He did not forgive this internist, even till this day. Well, if I have to give you all just three words of advice, I would say, tell the truth. And if I had to add three more words, I will say, all the time. Don't ever divulge from that. Now let's talk a little bit about empathy. Empathy is not the same as compassion. Compassion is something we feel when we see someone who is in need. It's a result, and as a result, we are motivated to help that person. That's compassion. Empathy is not to be confused with sympathy, which is also an emotion, a feeling for someone who is in need. In order to experience empathy, you need to listen, listen to your patients.
When I was in practice in Fremont, every Friday at 4 o'clock, I shut my office down. We had nine employees. I was the only physician in the practice. And basically, we'd sit around and we'd talk about pet beefs, what went wrong that week, what we should do to correct it. But I would start that session every single time with a reminder that when your patient comes into this office, it's the worst time in their lives. Remember that and listen to them, okay? My first lesson in empathy, I remember a 20-year-old son of a podiatrist in our community had come to see me with his mother. He was exercising and he was lifting weights above his head and his legs gave way. He fell to the floor. When he came to my clinic, I examined him. He had weakness of both his legs. I did some studies and I found that his spinal cord in the thoracic area was widened. Took him to surgery. I opened his spinal cord, which is not commonly done in private practice, and I used the laser and I cut his spinal cord open. I biopsied it. It turned out to be a very unusual diagnosis for the spinal cord. Glioblastoma multiforme of the spinal cord. Very unusual. So when his wound was healed, I had her come with her son to my office. I sat with her and I told her what was going on. He would probably not see the end of the year. When I told her this, she burst into tears, sobbed and shouted at me, what have you done to my son? I didn't say a word. I held her hand. I listened to what she said. She sobbed. And that boy died a few months later. That was my first lesson in empathy. I'll never forget it. Now, something I hope that none of you will ever face in your life, and that's malpractice. By the end of my career, 50% of everything I'd learned at the Cleveland Clinic was not what I practiced, because things had changed. It's of the utmost importance to keep up with the literature because it's changing all the time. Join the WANS, join the CNS, keep current with the medical literature. When you're well informed, your patients will be well informed and they'll know what to expect from you. When I went to England, Dr. Doan told me, Moses, if you do not learn how to do it in England, learn how not to do it, but learn. I was in my first week in private practice, and I was in Livermore. I came back, and the next day, Dr. Schiffer made rounds in Livermore Valley Memorial Hospital. He came back and told me, you're a very famous man now in Livermore. And I said, why? He says, you're on the front page of the newspapers. What happened? It seems that an orthopedic surgeon who was not experienced in surgery of the spine had actually done a misdiagnosis. He had diagnosed a lumbar spinal canal stenosis from multiple disc protrusions. The man was literally just married. His wife was there with him. He woke up paraplegic. He could not move his legs, could not control his bladder, his bowels, and he could not stand or walk. They consulted me. I went to Valley Care the next day. I saw the patient. I saw his myelogram. That time we had no scans. And I said, oh my God, this is not multiple disc protrusions. This man has lumbar canal stenosis. So I went to the radiologist, and they hadn't heard of that entity, so I had to educate them. Then I went to the floor, and I had to educate the patient and his wife. I said, your best chance to get well would be to have you go back into surgery and let me open your spinal canal. Your nerves are being choked. With great reluctance, reluctance, they agreed. I took him to surgery, opened his back, and I noticed that his dura was torn open. The nerves were bulging out. There was spinal fluid everywhere. So I repaired everything and put things together, opened the bones. The compression was relieved. He got up. Next day he could stand, the next day he could walk, and eventually went home. 
However, I learned from him much later in a very hard way that he had never gained his bladder or bowel control or his ability to have erections. So this is what Schiffer tells me. You are now a famous neurosurgeon in Livermore. I just read the morning paper which reads neurosurgeon renders his patient paraplegic with botched spine surgery. The plaintiff wanted $10 million from me. I was afforded a malpractice defense attorney and I was very, very, very upset. So I went to Oakland where my defense attorney was and he said, no problem, we'll make it go away, we'll just give them $350,000 and we'll be all fine. But I didn't do anything to him, I saved his life. I said, no, no, that's the way it's done. We settle cases. I came home, spoke to Nafisa, I said, let's go back to Mumbai, Bombay. We don't want this nonsense. And then I got the sudden sad news that the attorney had developed cancer of the throat and couldn't talk anymore. So his partner took on the case. And when I went to see him, he told me, we are not settling, we're going to fight this. And then he mumbled something to me. He said these words, illegitimate non carburandum. Didn't make any sense to me. After my deposition was taken, they dropped me from the case. All they needed from me was to state that the orthopedic surgeon did not know what he was doing, and I helped him. By the way, the literal translation of those words are, do not let the bastards grind you down. I've lived with that knowledge all my life. You have to keep on with your work. Now, a couple of words about mentoring. Remember to always share what you have learned with your colleagues and your junior fellows around you. You are now more experienced and knowledgeable by far by virtue of your excellent training here at the clinic. Not only do you have a vast experience and knowledge, but you bring with you something much more rare. That word is wisdom. You have to share this wisdom that you have acquired with anyone who wishes to learn and be a role model. Be confident in whatever you do, and most of all, be reliable. Know your limitations, and above all, do no harm. A very wise man, Swami Vivekananda, who was really quoting the Bhagavad Gita, once said, ask nothing, want nothing in return. Give what you have to give. It'll come back to you multiplied a thousandfold. But the attention must not be on that. You have the power to give, give, and there it ends. In conclusion, I need to talk to you about a 19th century American poet, Henry Wordsworth Longfellow, who stated in his poem, A Psalm of Life, lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime, and departing, leave behind us footprints in the sands of time. So for each of you in the graduating class, I want to tell you this. I have made copies of the Hippocratic Oath I'm going to give it to you. Take these copies of the oath, frame them, put them up on your walls in the office, and once in a while, read them, because it will keep you on the path. Thank you. Have a great life. And remember, never, ever retire. <laughs> Thank you all.